Kia ora and welcome to another episode of Rural New Zealand, proudly brought to you by Carfields. I'm your host Scotty Manford, join me as we check out what's happening throughout Canterbury. Alrighty, on this week's episode, we showcase the Ironman 4x4 camping equipment range, it's off to an award winning vineyard in Waipara, but first we meet one of the farmers that has entered the South Island Farm of the Year competition. I'm Simon Lee and I've been managing Mendip Hills for 10 years this December. Uh, Mendip Hills is owned by the, the Black family and they've owned it since, since the mid 50s. Um, Mendip is um, 6,100 hectares. We've got a wee support block down in Spotswood uh, 12 k's away which is 150 hectares irrigated at 180 hectares total. Then we've got another block in Ashburton uh, which is 150 hectares irrigated. So Mendip's, um, it's all, um, you know, we've got 180 hectares of dead flat, then we've got uh, rolling tractor country of about 2,000 hectares, and the balance is um, sort of Tussock, Managari, Hill Country or Manuka, and then sort of higher country, and we run to about 1,050 metres. Um, the flats down here around these sheds here were 180 metres above sea level. Um, we're running 34,000 stock units on this property here and the other finishing farms are running about between anywhere between 3,000 and 4,000 stock units at one time. Um, so we're sheep, beef and, and deer, um, breeding and uh, finishing. At Mendip here we run uh, 1,200 breeding cows and the majority of them are Hereford, so 70% Her straight Hereford and the balance are Angus or Angus Hereford Cross. And we um, fatten all the, all the progeny from the cattle uh, between Mendip and our finishing block down at Spotswood in Irrigation or our finishing block down in uh, Ashburton. We've just started and, and we're two years into it a genetics trial for beef and lamb. Uh, it's a six year project using uh, different uh, Hereford, um, Angus and Charolais genetics uh, for, and we've AI'd uh, out of our cow herd, we've AI'd um, 525 uh, synchronised program using as many different genetics as we can to try and see the different uh, growth and EBV estimates within those, um, with those traits of those cattle that have been bred. We want to try and explore everything and yeah try and you know try and get as much information out there to the New Zealand farmer as we can on the, on the different genetics we're using. So there's probably about oh, 15 different sires we're using every season but then every season we AI we're using different different ones again so we just keep rolling on. Yeah, and do a lot of do, do a lot of uh, monitoring of the of the stocks. A lot of weighing, a lot of conditions scoring. Um, uh, obviously, DNA um, uh, reproductive for the heifer side of it. Everything right through to the carving, and then all the the finished steer is is, is killed. Well, likes of these cattle here, these are first carving AI Herefords that are carving on these paddocks here. Most of our cows, or well. well all of our cows except for our first carvers are carved on the hill uh, underneath the, the ewes, set stocked on the hill. Um, all the cows are wintered on um, our higher country which is saved up over the summer. So that it's all, they're all wintered um, off, off their own backs on saved um, summer autumn pasture. We don't use a lot of supplementary feeding for our breeding cows um, and saying that we've had to in the last you know two or so years with the with the drought. Having deer on the farm is another part of improving the farming operation. So the deer at Mendip, we've got two wee deer farms at the moment, we're standing on the 64 hectares of um, sort of where we grow out the, the young stock. So like so these deer here, these are these are just about yearling um, hinds that have just come off fodder beaten on, onto grass. Um, and they stay here until they're uh, first mated, scanned in calf and then they make the 8k journey between up to the next deer farm on their hill country um, to carve and they stay up there um, for the rest of their life. So then the other, the other unit up there is 880 hectares. Uh, we run 1,280 hinds, breeding hinds, mixed age hinds up on that hill. 
Uh, so all those deer um, stay up there as sort of minimal inputs. We have to use um, the helicopter to get them in. They come in twice a year, once for weaning, once for TB testing, slash set stocking for the for the next fawning. Um, no supplementary feed um, added into it. There's sort of a low stocking rate, and we sort of add cows add, add cows into the system when need be. Um, so we wean them straight off the hind fawns down to this block here and the, all the stag fawns go straight off the hill and head straight to our uh, deer finishing unit down in Ashburton. And, yeah. and where do you sort of see the future of deer? Like it's been sort of doom and gloom for a while but you sort of feel like it's picking up again? Yep, no, no, we're, we're, um, we're right into the deer thing. So uh, our goal for Mendip is to um, get into 2,000 hinds. Uh, that's, that's our goal. So at the moment, um, in the next month, we're fencing another 10 k's of, of hill country opposite the deer shed, which will bring in another 90 hectares. Um, so that, that, that 90 hectares, well, you know, potentially for us, at our stocking rate where we can, um, you know, add cattle and sheep back into the system as well, without it being a totally deer unit, would potentially is probably going to bring us another 200 hinds. Um, and that country is actually in Lucerne at the moment, so we're just going to try a few different things with lactating hinds on that um, as, as well. But that that, that is the goal, um, so we will keep fencing and we're, we're, you know, we like the deer, it fits our system well because um, you know, the deer workers, <coughs> we're, we're lambing, calving and then the deer uh, work comes on straight after, after that and it suits our growth curve on that um, higher hill um, with when the lactating hind starts in the, uh, say the 1st of November and um, that country up there is, it's not high high but it sort of averages about 580 metres and um, it would usually only be at scrubby tussocky country and it would only really suit probably potentially single uh, you know, use lambing um, and we've changed it into venison production and um, we see the future really good and um, we're, yeah, we're, gonna, we're expanding. Before Simon arrived on the Mendip farm, sheep numbers were high and it was even a different breed. Here we run uh, 10,400 Romney ewes. Uh, ten, year, 10 years ago when I came here, we, um, they were all Corridor ewes. Um, we used to have uh, 11,200, I've just peeled it back a wee bit, uh, started crossbreeding. Um, I use my Romney um, rams or genetics from uh, the, the North Island. From We started crossbreeding and then keeping all our better Romney Corridale cross lambs and we just bred through like that and uh, obviously our older five year old ewes have um, still got a touch of Corridale through them. So as we started breeding our Corridale out, uh, we put started putting our terminal sires over our Corridale cross ewes and breeding just from our better Romney you know, percentage of genetics uh, lambs and um, we've gone through like that so we've had an increase in um, percentage we've sort of gone from 90% lambing and we're sitting at about 142% of the ram now. Um, body condition's gone up quite a bit and, um, and scanning percentages as well. We fatten all our lambs um, at, between Mendip Hills, um, our Spotswood irrigated block and also our Ashburton one and we also buy in lambs as well if, if, if things go well and lambs go out quickly and the season permits really. Uh, all the ewes are, um, are just grass wintered on the hill in, in, in rotations. Um, you know, same thing again, only in the last two years we've had to supplementary feed our sheep quite a bit. Young stock are growing out on uh, turnips or rape and grass. Um, to, as a two tooth um, and then as far as um, culling as well we've you know our terminal flock is, is, is usually made up of um, not only the corridor genetics but um, our sort of our off type sheep um, just trying to breed you know because we've had you know gone through a breed change it's been quite hard to try and get a, a sheep that, that we like but we're sort of we're, we're getting there now. Yeah, we're tailing, you know, 4,000 more lambs now than we were with 800 more ewes, mm -hmm. and that's sort of the main, been the main driver. And the main, the, the main driver now is trying to get as more lambs off mum. Um, on our 10th of December weaning draft last year was 24% lambs out of our, um, out of our sale lambs went prime. 
but I, you know, I'd love to be 28 to 30 percent. That would be my ultimate goal off off this whole country. With having a large scale operation, staff must be a huge part of it. We've got eight staff. There's eight of us, including me. Sorry, um, you know, your staff are everything, and you're only as good as your staff and how you, you know, how you either treat them or um, or provide, you know, the the right tools for the for the job and a good work environment. And um, you know, I like seeing and, and working with you know, younger staff and older staff and, and, you know, seeing them progress and build their skill levels up and, um, you know, head on to a, um, you know, a, a better job in, in the, you know, agricultural industry as a career. The future of Mendip Hills Station looks positive. I can probably speak for the family and, I, you know, so I've known them well enough now that I would think, you know, that, that it's, it's, it's here to, you know, under their um, guardianship, it's here to stay. Um, they love the place and they, um, they enjoy coming up here and being involved and not knowing what's going on and with the changes and development and they, they know what happened when. You know, even if it was 20 years ago, they know, you know, the milestones of the place and, um, yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good future for the Black family and for the, for the people that are, that are working for, the, for, the, for them as well. Well, thanks, Simon, for showing us around the farm and all the best for the competition. Alrighty, stay tuned, because after the break on Rural New Zealand, Vince and I are testing out some of the equipment from Iron Man 4x4. See you guys then. Welcome back to Rural New Zealand. With summer just around the corner, now's the time to start thinking about kitting out your 4x4 with some summer camping accessories. For a while now I've been hearing great things about the Iron Man 4x4 camping range, so I decided to test it out with Vince. First thing was finding a spot. Well, I reckon we might be able to find a camping spot down here somewhere. That sounds good. Do you reckon there'll be uh, some eels in there? I reckon there might be. I would say so. Maybe some fish. Might even have fresh fish for dinner, who knows. Yeah. Oh, I reckon there's a perfect spot just up here somewhere. What do you reckon? Well, I'm going to put a lot of trust and faith in you, so... How's that? Perfect. Our second challenge was setting up the tent and awning. So what's the plan Vince? What are we doing? Uh, let's set ourselves up for the night. So basically what we've got here is the, is the rooftop tent. So we'll, uh, we'll, yeah, so we'll get this one out and basically that'll uh, be a good, night, uh, good night's sleep in there. We've got a mattress and everything in there and the beauty of it is we can be on uh, this rough ground and tussock all round and we don't actually need to have a big flat spot for a tent So because yeah. it's, uh, it's up on the truck that's our good flat spot. Yeah. Over this side we've got our awning and this is, um, we'll pull this out and this will give us a bit of shade and a bit of cover as well and we'll, we'll be able to do our cooking and things under that for the night too so we'll be well set up. So we started with the tent, which was very easy. All Vince had to do was pull the ladder and she was up. I was very impressed. Oh wow, that's impressive. So yeah, so it's a really quick setup. And we'll just get in here and stick up a couple of poles. So room for two in there? Room for two in there. So that's what I like to hear. Pretty straightforward, isn't it? Yeah, she's pretty quick to set up all right, so. Yeah, I thought it would be here for about half an hour. So. But it literally took us two minutes. Yep. So that's that side of all set to go, so that's our sleeping sort of for the night. With bedding set up, it was time to move on to the awning. We undid the heavy duty PVC cover, then we unbuckled a few of the clips, we rolled it out, placed in the poles, and just like the tent, nice and simple. Look at that. So that's our little awning, so we can uh, get our camping gear set up under here now. And we're away. The Iron Man seats and tables offer ultimate comfort when you're travelling out and about in New Zealand. Good one, we've even got an Iron Man table. And you sit down. It's rated for 150 kilo Scott, so you should be right on that. Well Vince, I can't believe how quickly we got everything set up. What was that, 15 minutes maybe max? Yeah, so basically it's a, it's a canvas tent and they're, um, they're basically an Australian design, so designed to go on top of your vehicle and, and the beauty of them is that uh, you've got your tent with you everywhere and they're nice and quick and easy to set up and, and you're off the ground. And, you know, typical Australia, you've got snakes and crocodiles and those sorts of things that you want to keep out, so being up there is a, a real advantage. So. Safer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they're, they're made from a, a ripstop canvas, which is a very tough material, um, so they're, they're water and windproof, and um, they have a 
high density foam mattress built into them so basically your mattress is with you everywhere you go as well so it's, a, it's, it's an easy little setup probably yeah five minutes to set them up and, and you know similar to, to um, put away again too and, and you're ready to drive so great little setup yeah and this awning that, that even was even quicker yeah and that looks yeah. like it's gonna be light up there it has yeah it's got a little led light strip built into it so that's um, a, a neat little feature when you're out camping you can have a they're light, but you know they're really quick to set up. They're just um, again stored on the on the side of your vehicle, bolted on, um, and uh, a couple of minutes to uh, unzip it. And, and um, they have telescopic legs on them that you you just twist and lock and uh, set the thing up. It's great. So yeah, great for uh, a bit of sun shelter or a little bit of rain shelter as well. So really quick. Vince wasn't that keen to top and tail next to me, so he decided to set up his own swag about 50 metres away from camp. What are you doing over there, Vince? I'm setting up my swag, Scott. I think, uh, I think I'll leave you over here and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll set myself up miles away from you. Suit yourself, I am a heavy snorer. I don't think you'd be the kind of person who'd like roughing it. Oh, uh, this isn't roughing it, this is luxury, Scott, I tell you. After we erected it, the swag looked like it had some cool features. Nice hot night, that's where you could have that on top, wouldn't you? And then when it decides to rain tonight or snow, <laughs> you put that on top. Absolutely, so again they've got a nice uh, mattress built into them, so there you go there. Oh, that's nice and spongy, yep. Yep, and uh, we do a little single and a double, this is a single one, so we do a double one as well, so you can get a two person one as well, so great little features again. Waterproof, windproof, uh, all you need for when you're out camping. Ironman aren't just a 4x4 accessory company, they also have the equipment to help you enjoy the outdoors. Yeah, well, we've set our camp up for the night, so uh, we would better try and get us some, something to eat so we can uh, get the old fishing rod out and have a crack. So what we've got here is the, is the Ironman multi-rod, so it's... Um, it's a fishing rod with a whole lot of different accessories and you can actually make uh, 36 different rod combinations up with it. So uh, basically the way it works is it's just a, a, um, a push together system and we put all the units on on there and we make a big fishing rod out of it. Yes. So it's very compact and uh, easy to use and the good thing is we can uh, make a surf caster if we're at the beach um, and here we buy a river so we'll just make a little short spinning rod out of it. Um, but yeah, 36 different combinations and uh, it's, it's a great little thing to have in the back of your truck when you go away camp. Yeah, yeah, and it even comes with a reel. Yeah, it comes with a reel, a couple of different, you've got three different spools of line so depending on what you're doing, again if you're surf casting you want a nice heavy line, but if you're just spinning in the river you want a nice little fine line. So yeah, it comes with three easy quick change spools on the, on the, on the reel. Yeah. And of course the chilli bin down there for when we catch our fish. Yep. You know, we've got somewhere to put it. So Yeah, yeah. so so ours are uh, it's actually it's an Iron Man and it's a it's a full fridge freezer, so it's actually can operate as a fridge or a freezer and it'll go right from um, positive nine degrees right down to negative nineteen. So we can actually uh, freeze ice in it and all sorts of things. So it's a great little um, fridge freezer. And uh, it plugs into either the mains or we can plug it into a 12 volt system as well. So just onto the cigarette lighter. So yeah, pretty essential when you're out camping if you want to keep your, your essential meats and beers and things cold. Yeah. Uh, you can put the fridge on and if you want to, you can uh, also freeze down uh, meat and, and ice and all those things. So yeah, great little feature. And this is a, a 50 litre one, so it's got a uh, nice big capacity in there so we can um, you know, get about 50 litres of product in there, so nice little units. With all the camping equipment ready to go, there was only a few things we had left to do, and that was put the jug on and watch the sun set beyond those mountains. I can certainly see myself sleeping in something like that next to a river this summer. Alrighty, stay tuned on Rural New Zealand because after the break we meet an award winning organic vineyard. See you guys then. Welcome back to Rural New Zealand. Now Greystone is an award winning winery in Wipera and we caught up with Nick Gill who showed us around the property. Greystone Vineyard is an award winning winery in Wipera. A southerly blast had just blown through Canterbury but Nick Gill, who is general manager, showed us around the property. 
Greystone property is uh, 165 hectares. And we've got about 32 hectares of vineyard planted on it at the moment. Um, and a really important part of producing great wine is the soil in the stone, like the bedrock that's underneath it, and also the local climate. Um, so just here to the east of us, we've got the Teviot Dales. So they're really important for the Wiper Valley um, because they basically force the cold easterly sea breezes up and it helps us to maintain a, a warmer temperature over the growing season. Um, and just behind you, we've also got limestone. So limestone is a really important part of our story. Uh, the best wines in the world, and in particular Burgundy, comes from areas that always have a significant amount of limestone. Uh, and the windblown loess and the clays that we've got here in the limestone producing environment, it's not overly lush for the vineyard. So you don't want vines to grow like Triffids, you want them to fight a little bit. And what they do is they, they explore a greater volume of soil. And as they do that, they, they draw greater complexities into the wine. So we planted the vineyard in 2004. Uh, you can get your first crop three years later. And after about, probably another three years after that, you can taste that the wines are starting to get more complex and more herbaceous characters. So savouriness and herbaceous uh, are some of the things that we sort of look for in elegant Pinot Noir that we're making, yeah. Yeah, so in terms of geography and, and stuff what you just mentioned, does that affect which wines you can grow? Yeah, definitely. So we're quite a long way south to be growing Syrah, for instance. So we've got a small block of Syrah here and you wouldn't generally go too far south to grow Syrah. What we really focus on is Pinot Noir, um, Chardonnay, Riesling, Pinot agree um, so yeah we need a, a cool climate and a north facing aspect to the sun um, the northwest conditions that we get in spring are a big part of the terroir here in Wiper so although they're hard to work in and you know nobody enjoys a, a, a big northwest uh, storm um, what it does is it slows the vines down a little bit in the growing season and it does tend to the stress response I think tends to lead to um, slightly thicker skins and smaller berries and gives us the intensity that is so typical of uh, Wiper Pinot. So having the the vineyard and then the conjoining farm, does that help with sort of running of things? Yeah, well? definitely. So, you know, no vineyard is an island that exists in the wider environment and this one's on a, on a larger farm. Um, so when uh, the Thomas brothers bought this property and they asked me to plant the vineyard, we selected the best sort of microclimates and sites for each variety. So we've got the aromatics down on the flats in the heavier soils and then we come up the slopes onto Pinot and Riesling and Chardonnay. There's a lot of um, south facing and east facing slopes that they're just not suitable for growing premium grapes. Uh, so we partnered up with the, the neighbouring property, um, Steve Ellis at Glenray. He's a really great farmer and we've re-fenced around all the vineyard blocks so we're able to effectively move the stock in and out of the vineyard at key times. Um, you know, sheep are preferential grazers so if you put 600 sheep into a, a really big section all they're going to do is eat the ice cream if you like and leave all the rest of the weeds. So we like to put them in, crash graze them, take them out and you manage that. And uh, what we found is after air harvest, which is finishes in April, May, uh, the farmer brings the sheep in, they're quite pregnant by then and they seem to go straight for the weeds that cause us a lot of trouble. So the, for instance the mallow with a big taproot, um, you know they get established and they're, they're in pain. The sheep come in, I, I don't know if they're looking for minerals or what it is, but they eat them and they eat them right down into the ground and move off again and uh, they seem to leave the grass in the mid rows as their last preference. Um, and we just find that using sheep, we have lambing in the vineyard and we run sheep in the vineyard right up until the buds are starting to grow and they're getting quite green. Um, it means we're not using any diesel for weed control and we're cycling the, the grass and the weeds into the nutrient cycle of the vineyard. I think it's helping with um, soil fertility and also water infiltration. So I see sort of the bigger farm and the wind breaks around it and running that effectively is a big part of having, you know, a productive vineyard producing great wine. Once the grapes are harvested, it's just a short drive down the road to see where the grapes are transformed. Once we get the grapes in from the vineyard, we bring them into the winery. Um, and the aim is to produce really balanced, clean grapes uh, that you can trust essentially. And then the wine, people say wine makes itself, that's not true, but it's a really hands-off process. So we put it through a machine called a distemmer, which basically knocks the, the berries off the bunches. Um, and then we've got maybe 1.8 tonnes of just Pinot Noir berries. They look like lots of black marbles in a, in a tub and we basically cool that down and we leave it and fermentation naturally happens by itself. Um, once that happens you notice a few bubbles and the, the skins start to break down and come to the surface and we, we plunge them by hand to extract the colour and the flavour and the tannin uh, and it, they stay in that fermenter for maybe four weeks uh, and when that's finished we press them off skins, the wine goes into the barrels 
and we basically leave it there for 12 months, all we have to do is make sure that the barrel remains full because oxygen is the enemy of wine. So uh, what's called alleage, which is the air gap at the top, we, we make sure that's not there, so we fill them with wine every two weeks. Um, the barrel imparts you know, beautiful fa flavour and balance to the wine, and we've got our own bottling lines, so that'll be, these barrels will be emptied uh, and put in the bottle just before the next vintage, ready for another rotation. Uh, Greystone produces 18,000 cases of wine per year. Uh, there's actually seven varieties in there, so if you look just to their Pinot Noir, it's around 4,000 cases, four to 6,000 depending on the season. Um, our other main varieties are Pinot Gris, um, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, we've got a little bit of Syrah. So Nick, you do all the hard work on the vineyard and then it must be great to see the business end. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is why we all do it, you know. Um, being able to taste the, the wine that came from the vineyard, you know exactly which block it came from and you took them through from bud burst to harvest, take them into the winery and help with the vinification, get it into the bottle, it doesn't leave the site. Um, so here we are in the Greystone cellar door and, you know, it just brings it all together really and it makes it one of the most rewarding things that I've ever been involved with. Um, so yeah, this is what it's all about. We have a lot of visitors that come through and always really enjoy showing people over the vineyard and talking about the wines with them and just also helps to um, give us greater understanding of how people from all over the world view different wines. You know, people with different cultures and different cuisines have totally different things that they are looking for in wine and beverages. So, you know, that's always really interesting now, the global economy that we've got and so many visitors coming to New Zealand. Um, you know, the people from the, the US and the UK are looking for different wine characters, for instance, from the people from China. Um, and we've got something for everyone, and that's what makes it a really rewarding industry to work in. Yeah, and you guys, uh, you won Vineyard of the Year, so it yeah, must so be pretty exciting. Yeah, that's been awesome. So the, the Organic Wine Awards uh, started in 2014, and this year we won the Vineyard of the Year uh, in that, and we got uh, three gold medals. Uh, so it was really pleasing. Uh, so so it is a, it's a challenge, that initial transition from conventional to organic, but once you get it going, uh, it just becomes second nature, really. Uh, um, but the Organic Wine Awards now, I think that's important to recognise that there's now so many producers that are organic in New Zealand that there's that kind of grounds, groundswell to um, you know, have a competition that's based wholly on organic wines um, and also the organic conferences and so forth that are becoming more commonplace now. Uh, you know, New Zealand's never going to make uh, the most wine, but we can make the best wine and we can make it in a way that we tread really lightly on the, on the planet. So, you know, that's something that we all take a lot of pr pride in, yeah. yeah. And now I'm going to ask you a pretty loaded question, but um, which which is your favourite wine? Yeah, well, we're standing right here in front of it, actually, the Thomas Brothers Reserve. So, yeah, it's here at Reserve Pinot Noir, and it's kind of, you know, what we set out to do, which is make the very best wine that we can. And this, this actual uh, wine has won the Decanter World Wine Trophy uh, twice. Um, so, you know, for, for Pinot Noir, so it's a wine that we're very proud of and the street speaks very strongly of the place, yep. Well, thanks for joining us today on Rural New Zealand from Gore Bay. I certainly hope you enjoyed the show. Just remember to give us a like on Facebook, and if you're silly enough to miss an episode, you can watch it on demand. Join us next week as we journey down to Otago to meet the Carfields primary wool team. See you guys then.